Vectors are an important quantity that arise throughout a multivariable calculus class. And the purpose of this video is to provide a brief introduction to vectors. You may have seen some of these topics before in a previous class, or maybe perhaps a trigonometry or algebra class. If you are a student who's taken physics, certainly you've seen vectors as well. So simply put, a vector is any quantity that is characterized by both magnitude and direction. Examples of vector quantities, how fast one travels and the direction of travel. So we have a magnitude and we have a direction. Displacement, how far one is from a specified point and the direction of travel from that point to the individual. Gravitational force exerted by the earth on an object. The magnitude is measured in pounds or newtons. This would be the imperial system, the metric system, and the direction is toward the center of the earth. So two attributes, magnitude and direction. Now scalars are quantities that have magnitude only. Speed is an example of a scalar. We could be driving 50 miles an hour, but unless we specify the direction, we don't have a vector yet. So a scalar has only magnitude. Temperature is another example of a scalar, as is distance. Now, vectors can be represented in different ways. So symbolically, we usually denote a vector using either the arrow notation. If we have a vector v, we can put an arrow above it, or we can use a boldface font. And I typically will do the second of these, the boldface font. Numerically, we can indicate a vector in component form. So maybe it'd be better to look at the graphical form as well. Let's say I have a vector that points from the origin to the point 4, 3. So it has a direction indicated by the arrow, and it has a magnitude or a length. So how would we describe the fact that the vector points 4 units in the horizontal and 3 units in the vertical direction, respectively? Well, we could put this together as a vector 4, 3. And I'm going to use braces here as opposed to parentheses because I want to distinguish this from the point 4, 3. And you'll see why in just a moment. If you've taken linear algebra, you may have seen column vector notation. So we could write this vector as 4, 3. If you've taken some physics, frequently physics notation is 4i plus 3j, where the coefficient of i represents how much the vector is pointed in the x direction, and the coefficient of j indicates how much the vector points in the y direction. Of these three forms, I will predominantly use the angle bracket uh, notation 4, 3. So again, we can represent this vector graphically, drawing a vector that starts at the origin and ends at the point 4, 3. The length or the norm of a vector, those are synonymous, is determined using the Pythagorean theorem, where we consider the components of the vector as the two legs of a right triangle. So for example, if I have the vector 4, 3, the magnitude or the norm, which we sometimes indicate using absolute value signs or a little double absolute value sign like this, would be we take the square of the first component, the square of the second component, add them together, and take the square root. And so that gives us 5. And so that means the length of this vector is 5. A unit vector is a vector having length 1. So for example, the vector 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2 is a unit vector, because if I square this, I get a half. If I square this, I get a half as well. Add the two together, you get 1, and the square root of 1 is 1. We'll be using unit vectors a lot in multivariable calculus. A vector is characterized by just its magnitude and direction. This means we can always move a vector and place it somewhere else in such a way that the the vector is the same so long as we don't change its length or magnitude and the direction or where it points. So here's what that means. This vector, I could pick it up and I could move it anywhere. And so long as the vector points in the same direction or is parallel to this vector and has a length of 5, we consider it to be the same vector. That's why we don't use the point notation parenthesis 4, 3 here. 
because that would indicate just a point, and we want to indicate a vector which could be moved around if needed. We're going to perform basic operations on vectors. We can multiply vectors by scalars. We can add vectors together. We cannot multiply vectors, however. Scalar multiplication and vector addition. Now, the mathematical process is fairly simple if you have the vectors in component form. When multiplying a vector in component form by a scalar, we simply multiply each component by the scalar. So for example, if we take the vector 2, 3, and if we multiply 2, 3 by the scalar 2, we simply multiply 2 by each component. So 2 times 2 is 4, 2 times 3 is 6. Likewise, if we wanted to take the vector b and multiply by 1 third, we would take 1 third of 2, which is 2 thirds, and 1 third of 3, which is 1. And then finally, if we took the vector b and we multiplied it by negative 1, we would just multiply each of the original components by negative 1. These three examples illustrate stretching, shrinking, and reversing. When I multiplied vector b by 2, I stretched. When I multiply the vector b by a third, I shrink. And when I multiply the vector b by negative 1, I reversed it. So here's a picture. What I've drawn here, this is the vector v, 2, 3. If I stretch this vector or multiply it by 2, I get the vector 4, 6, which is that entire vector. I've actually superimposed the vectors. It may be a little bit hard to see. If I take the vector 2, 3 and multiply it by a third, I get a vector which is about that. So we've taken the vector v, we've stretched it. We that means we multiplied by something greater than 1 in absolute value. We can take the vector v and multiply it by something less than 1, and that shrinks it. And if we take the vector v and multiply it by negative 1, it just turns it around so it points in the opposite direction. That's what we call scalar multiplication of a vector. We can think of it numerically and we can think of it graphically as well. Let's talk about adding two vectors together. When we add two vectors together in component form, we simply add the corresponding components. So for example, we have vector v is 2, 3 and the vector u is minus 1, 4. Then to create, compute the sum, we simply add the corresponding components. 2 plus negative 1 is 1. 3 plus 4 is 7. So the sum of the vectors v and u is 1, 7. Here's an example that involves both scalar multiplication and vector addition. Suppose v is 2, 3 and u is negative 1, 4, like above. Let's calculate 2v minus u. So we take the vector 2, 3, and we multiply it by the scalar 2, and then we're going to subtract the vector u, which is negative 1, 4. First, multiply by the scalar. So we get 4, 6, multiplying the 2 by each of these separately. And then we have the vector negative of negative 1, 4. So let's multiply by negative 1 each of the components inside to give us 1, negative 4. And now we simply add the components. 4, 1 adds together to be 5. 6 plus negative 4 adds together to be 2. Now we're going to think about this graphically. Multiplying by a vector, a vector by a scalar will stretch and or shrink and or reverse its direction. We talked about that a moment ago. We can add vectors graphically using the tip-to-tail method. So here's, a, here's the example. Here's the vector v, which was 2, 3. That's the letter V. Here's the vector U, which was minus 1, 4. Okay? Now, remember that we can take a vector and we can move it. And so long as we don't change the direction nor the length, we haven't changed the vector. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the vector U and I'm going to slide it so that the tail of V maps corresponds to the tip of u. This is the tip of u, that's the tail of u. So if I slide this, so the tail of u is at the tip of v, I get something that looks like this. And now we simply 
follow the arrows out to get the sum v plus u, which is sometimes called the resultant vector. We could also take the vector v and we could move it so that its tail corresponds to the tip of u. And if we did that, we would get this vector starting here and ending there. And if we follow the arrows to get the resultant, we would end up here as well, v plus u. A third way is to construct a parallelogram using the vectors u and v. This is the method that I typically choose. If we take these two vectors and form a parallelogram, we get something that looks like this. And the result of u and v added together is simply the diagonal of the parallelogram. So whichever method works easiest for you. Now let's go back and take a look at the previous example. The previous example where we had 2v minus u. Let's look at things graphically. So 2v. Let's take the vector v and let's stretch it by a factor of 2. If I do that, I'll get a vector that looks, I'm going to switch to green here, I get something that looks like that. So that's the vector 2v, that vector. Now let's take a look at minus u. Minus u means I take the vector u and I point it in the opposite direction. And if I do that, oopsie, I get something that looks roughly like that. I kind of ran out of space. Okay, so the vector u minus u looks something like that, and then 2v. So if I want to get 2v minus u, I can take this vector add it to that vector, that's minus u, using either the tip-to-tail method or the parallelogram method. I'm going to use the parallelogram method. I'm going to form a parallelogram using this vector and that vector. And let's see, I want to draw something reasonable that agrees more or less with the answer we just got. So let's take this. So I'm going to take minus u, and I'm going to slide it up to this point right here. So I'm going to take minus u, I'm going to move it up. That's going to give me that vector. So here I use the tip-to-tail method. So here's the vector v. Here's 2v. I took the vector minus u and I slid it up so that the tail corresponded to the, the tail of 2v corresponded to the tip of minus u. And then I followed the arrows this way. Another way to think about it is that if we took this vector and this vector, and added them, created a parallelogram, we would get this vector right here. So the resultant vector is actually that vector which agrees more or less with the 5, 2 that we got a few moments ago. So let me say that again. If we were to construct a parallelogram, we would take this green vector and that green vector, 
and we would form a parallelogram. The diagonal of that parallelogram is going to start at the origin and it's going to end right here. So this vector in red is the vector 2v minus u, graphically. Let me see if I can zoom this out just a little bit. Okay, let's go on to another example. So to summarize, multiplying a vector by a scalar will stretch or sink. and or reverse the direction of a vector, vectors are added graphically using the tip-to-tail or parallelogram method. Another operation that's going to be important throughout the semester is throughout the semester is what's known as normalizing a vector. Many times we're going to want to find, take a vector, and we're going to want to normalize it. So here's what that means. Take a vector like 4, 3, compute its length, which we said was 5, take the vector v and divide by the length. Now remember, dividing by a number is the same as multiplying by as the reciprocal of multiplying by its reciprocal. So all we're really doing is scalar multiplication here. 1 over 5 times the vector 4, 3. And using the property of how we multiply a scalar by a vector, one-fifth of vector 4, 3 is four-fifths, three-fifths. Now here's what that does. If we take this vector, four-fifths, and if we were to compute its length, we would get a vector of length 1. So normalizing a vector does the following. You take the vector, divide it by its length, and you get a new vector, which is a unit vector. That means it has length 1. Normalizing is important. We'll do that a lot this semester. Displacement vectors. Suppose we have a point P and we have a point Q and we want to find a vector that connects P to Q. We call this a displacement vector. We write it as PQ and we put an arrow above it. So for example, if P is minus 1, 2 and Q is 4, 5, the way to compute PQ is to take the x-coordinate of the starting vector Subtract that from the x-coordinate of the ending point, I'm sorry, 4 minus a minus 1 is 5. Take the ending point, take its y-coordinate, which is 5, and subtract the, the, the y-coordinate of the starting point, which is 2. So that's 5 minus 2, which is 3. So again, you want to be careful about the order. We subtract the entries of P from the entries of Q if we want the displacement vector from P to Q. If we want the vector from displacement vector from Q to P, that would be just the opposite, minus 5, minus 3. So they point in opposite directions. And here's a graphical illustration. There's the point P, there's the point Q, there's the displacement vector. Looks like that. So we've talked about normalizing vectors, we've talked about displacement vectors. Another task that we'll be using quite frequently is that of resolving into components. So sometimes we might know the length of a vector and we might know its direction usually specified in the form of an angle, and we want to write it in component form. In other words, we want to find the x, y, and in three-dimensional space, the z component as well. This is what's known as resolving a vector into components. So here's a simple example. Suppose we know that v is a vector of length 5, and it makes an angle of minus pi over 4 relative to the positive x-axis. So the vector v looks something like this. We want to be able to resolve it into components. We want to be able to find the x portion and the y portion. And we can use some basic trigonometry to do this. We know that the cosine of pi over 4 is this length divided by the hypotenuse length, which is 5. Another way of rewriting that is to say that 5 times the cosine of minus pi over 4 is that length right there. 
Well, the cosine of minus pi over 4 is 1 over root 2, so 5 times 1 over root 2 is just 5 over root 2. That gives me the x component. Now, I also know that the sine of pi over 4 would be the opposite length divided by the hypotenuse, which is 5. In other words, 5 times the sine of minus pi over 4 would give us minus 5 over root 2. Notice how that's negative, which is correct because we want a vector that points downwards in the y direction. So that would be minus 5 over root 2. So another important task is being able to resolve a vector in components if you know its length and if you know something about the angle. In preparation for class, please do the following. Here are two vectors, v and u. Calculate each of these quantities, 2v minus 3u, 4v plus 3u, but then calculate the length of that result. Find a displacement vector from the point q equals 3, 5 to the point r equals minus 5, 8. Suppose v is a vector of length 4, which makes an angle of pi over 3 relative to the positive x-axis. Resolve the vector into its component form. Now please use exact values. You should know at this point what the cosine and sine of pi over 3 are exactly. What I've drawn in this picture are two vectors u and v. I haven't told you the components. I want you to be able to sketch one half v, so that's just going to be shrinking, 3u, which is going to be stretching, and then the difference, u minus 1 half v. So please do these in preparation for class.